All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. All right, today I get a chance to have a discussion with somebody. He was introduced to me by my friend Tom Hall. His name's William Fields, and he has quite a remarkable uh, music practice. Uh, it's uh, He came to Tom's notes because Tom had been at the Algorithmic Arts Conference in San Francisco a while back and was kind of blown away by William's work and uh, introduced him to me, and I have been equally blown away, so I'm very anxious to talk to him. So with no further ado, let's have a chat with William. Hey, William, how's it going? Great, great. Thanks for having me. It's it's an honor to be on here. Oh, it's an honor to have you. I am. Uh, thank you, first of all, for sharing uh, some of your work with me so that I could kind of dive in. And I ended up diving in pretty deep because, first of all, there's a lot there. And secondly, it's really <laughs> it's really kind of compelling. Um, for listeners who might not be might not really know your work, why don't you explain a little bit about your work? Well, uh, at the moment, there's kind of two sides to it. So I do a lot with uh, algorithmic composition and, and generative music on the one hand, which really culminated in this uh, project that I did called Fields OS that you're referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, and that music is all 100% generative. So it's completely hands-off. I program my music system to generate the music based on certain rules and and I press record and I let it go. So that's kind of the one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum is the the music that I uh, I've released on various labels that are uh, and that I do in a live performance setting, which is more improvisational. So and, and in that case, it's very hands on. I have a a controller where I'm controlling all aspects of the music in, in the moment. And the music that I release is all just a, a live recording of these performances, basically. So uh, I don't work with you know, in a doll in with I haven't touched a piano roll in probably 15 years <laughs> at oh, this point. You. <laughs> or, or, yeah, or or you know drawing envelopes or anything like that. It's it I basically just sit down and play and record the results. And um, you know, the good ones that are are the ones that I release basically. Sure. So it's kind of two extreme ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, I'm doing uh, music that's very hands-on and improvisational. And on the other extreme, it's completely hands-off and algorithmic. So, Yeah, that's really interesting because not only is it two ends of the spectrum in terms of it being, you know, how, how you describe your work, but it's kind of two completely different versions of what of the work process as well, right? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I think a lot of it comes out of the fact that I don't, have a whole lot of time to spend on music and you know i'm a bit lazy uh so i want to make things as you know fast and easy and fun as possible but on the other hand there is some overlap in that in my live performance practice on that end of the spectrum i am also using these algorithms to kind of dialogue with in some ways so i can kind of press a button and it'll throw me into a kind of random musical space. And then I improvise based on that. So, uh, you know, it's, it, which is kind of thrilling in a, in a real live performance up on stage when uh, but you're about to push a button and you don't know what it's going to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you, you just have to work with whatever it gives you. So that's kind of what, like what I did at the um, uh, performance at Algorithmic Arts Assembly in San Francisco that you were talking about. So I'm up on stage and Basically, I'm, I'm hitting a button that, that just throws me somewhere random, and then I'm steering it and working with it and trying to make it into a, a musical, you know, arc or narrative. And then for I'll push another, I'll push the button again, and it'll throw me somewhere else random, and then I work with that. So there is there's some overlap, um, you know, between the two. Sure, but that also seems like um, 
if you don't mind me saying, that seems like sort of a crack-headed approach to things. <laughs> because in my experience, <laughs> for the most part, a lot of people, when they when they do utilize computers and algorithms in live performance, it's to pro- kind of provide a safety net for their work so that, you know, their their live work is still within some parameters that that provide them a, a sense of ease. It seems to me like you are literally putting stumbling blocks on yourself, and then part of the performance is like watching you sort of like survive that that process. <laughs> yeah, well, it makes it more exciting uh, for me, <laughs> and hopefully, you know, for the audience too. But to be fair, the, the algorithms are not completely random. So I use uh, tuned randomness. I mean, I, I do have the option of, of going completely random. Mm-hmm. And usually that doesn't sound too good. And it's hard to dig your way out of that. Right. Uh, but but I do have different, uh, different buttons that have different algorithms that are tuned in different ways. So I can have some degree of control of like what's going on. Like I could have I don't. Know, I might have a button that, that generates like a footwork type track, and, and so I, I know that I'm going to get something that's high energy that has you know triplets or certain things. So I I kind of know what's going on, um, but yeah, it it makes it exciting, and you know I, I also I'm a I'm a big fan of jazz, and um, so that's also an influence where. You know, you're you're improvising in the moment. You're you're working with what you're given and, and trying to make something good out of it. Right, right. Well, it is kind of interesting though. This idea of like tuning algorithms to be useful. Um, you're doing it in your live work, but that also is kind of the uh, kind of the concept behind the Fields OS work. Now, that was originally like a radio type show, right? Right. Yeah. So there was a call for entries that went out uh, for submissions for uh, the radio station Resonance Extra. Mm. Um, there was they were looking for radio shows that have did something different. Um, they were not a typical like DJ playing records type thing. And um, I had this system that I developed that could generate endless amounts of music, and I was kind of looking for an outlet for that like how can i take advantage of this this system that this this abundance that the system has to generate so much music and so i came across this um this thing for residence extra and i put together a proposal submitted it and it was accepted and so yeah it was a weekly radio show where each week uh, i released an hour of new music that was generated by my music system you know, each week was basically a different genre or some kind of algorithm or approach. And yeah, I would set up the system, press record, and then press play, and then the system would run for an hour. And that would be the radio show, basically. And I, I would do some, you know, talk over and do some mm-hmm. introduction and so forth. Um, but, and, you know, I, of course, I had to sometimes do multiple takes if like the first oh, couple sure. of tracks were stinkers or something i I would start again uh but but i did not edit really i mean uh, if there was uh, a bad something that was harsh or difficult in the middle of it i I would just leave it in i would you know i was not curating the results at all that's really yeah that's really interesting now i i'll also say that uh there's some intrigue just in looking through the title. So uh, <laughs> the Fields OS uh, file set uh, is 24 tracks, and it starts off like pretty understandable electro hip hop techno, but eventually you get into breeding music or Brownian techno or whatever, and or unconstrained, which I was one that I actually liked. Uh, my favorite was number 20 called Variety, which I wasn't sure what I was going to get into, and I. Got got into it and I just found it a really charming sort of like mishmash and a uh, very eclectic sounding thing. But what's amazing to me is that while, while generative, it didn't have kind of the, what I had come to be thinking of as generative mu- music, which would have one or two, one of two aspects, either it would be very random or it would be 
hyper predictable. And especially as things would tend, people would tend to try and make it sound like a particular style of music, it would tend to get more and more predictable. Almost like, and I have to, I have to admit a bias here. If I imagined what machine learning techno would be like, you know, I was, (laughs) I was scared it would be that, right? And it was very much not. It was very much alive. It was, it kind of breathed. It, it was transforming in a way that, that kind of moves stuff forward. And I, I, was, I found it really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of probability involved. So at the core of it is a kind of probabilistic sequencer. So it's not going to repeat the same thing every bar. You know, that there's some subtle randomness and it's there's kind of a scripting to it. So, for example, it'll generate something and play it for or I'll program the system so that it'll generate something, play that for, I don't know, four or eight bars, and then it'll generate a a variation on that where 10% of the parameters are different. Got it. So so then that sounds like kind of the next section of the song. It's You can tell it's still the same song because it's mostly the same, Mm -hmm. but 10% of it is different. So it sounds like, oh, this is like the B section, right? Right. And then, then I might jump back to the A section and then after eight more bars, then I might create uh, a variation on the variation. So it's, again, like it sounds somewhat familiar, but a little bit different. And so through that, I was able to kind of create song structure and variation on the original. So it's not like I'm generating something and then it just sits there and runs for whatever, you know, 32 bars or something. It, it's, there, it's generating variations within that structure. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. And that's, I, I, you know, when you say it that way, it's, I can, I can kind of, you know, hear it in my mind and how that's working. It's, it's really cool. Um, so one of the things I like doing on my podcast is talking to people about their background and, and how they got to be the artists that they are. And in your case, uh, it seems like there's, there's gotta be some really interesting background because to, to come to things and have sort of like the kind of analytical mind it takes to come up with algorithms to do these, uh, sort of genre oriented, uh, works comes like from one area and, and conversely the kind of, Chut spot it takes to say, okay, I'm going to play live and have stuff like blurt stuff out and, and be able to dance on a wire to make that happen is kind of a different space. And I'm curious to know where you've, where you came from. Yeah. Um, and it, it's also, I've found uh, telling the story is a good way to explain how my music system and, and fields OS works also. So, so I guess the beginning for me was when I got a Commodore 64 as a kid and I got really hooked on computers and programming, I would get this, uh, some magazine, some programming, maybe it was Commodore 64 magazine or something like that. They had, they would have, it would have code in the back of the magazine and you'd have to type it in Oh yeah. in order, in order to run the program or the game or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's when I learned that if a single character is out of place, it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> So I got hooked on computers and programming early. Like it just resonated with my brain. It's just uh, I just love it naturally um, for some reason. And you know, then I got into bulletin board systems. So I'm dating myself here. This is uh, you know, before the internet, really. And there was uh, some of the listeners might be familiar with. Uh, it's called ANSI art. So it's this kind of uh, I would make this artwork for. Uh, the bulletin board systems where you'd have to dial in with a modem and you could you would connect and then you'd see this kind of intro screen, very blocky, pixelated kind of artwork. So I got into that scene of making ANSI art. Um, and then from there, I discovered there was a way, this music thing that people were doing with trackers, and they're called like mod trackers. And that's when I first got into the music side of things. And I got really hooked on that. You know, people would create these mod files and upload them to the BBSs and share them and stuff like that. Uh, it was you could make your own samples. It was fantastic. And that was I actually still have some of the old mod files, believe it or not. Um, and the earliest ones I have are from like 92, 1992, I think, 93. 
is when I first started making electronic music on the on the trackers. Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, things progressed. You know, I, I made music on like Cakewalk and FL Studio, you know, regular DAW type programs. And I, you know, for a long time, I made music in this kind of traditional way of you know, using a doll, drawing in notes uh, on the piano roll, and you know, slaving over a track for you know hours and hours and hours, weeks and weeks, slaving over the 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 mix downs and driving myself crazy. Sure, uh, you know, trying to get it to sound good. And uh, so for many years, I worked in this that way. It took a lot of time and was you know challenging, uh, not always fun. And then I, you know, I had kids and, and and that changed things a lot because I just didn't have the time anymore. I was also working, you know, full-time job. And, you know, for a while, I, I just wasn't really making music much just because I didn't have the time. But then uh, I started playing music with a, a friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Beck. And we still uh, make music together and release it as uh, Beck Fields. And he's an amazing singer, musician, pian- uh, pianist, classically trained. He's incredible. Um, but we started just improvising together. And at first, I just had a very simple, I was just running him through effects, basically. And then I started to develop that system more and more. I got you know, maybe a, a controller uh, to make it easier. I ended up getting, I use Lemur, um, the iPad app now as my main controller. On the, and that makes it really easy to kind of change things around and evolve the system over time, you know. And so then at that point, I'm improvising a lot with, with my friend Jeremy, and I have this music system. But uh, over time, I develop it more and more to the point where I, now I can make beats in it, and now I have synths. Uh, develop this kind of step sequencer thing, and it gets more and more sophisticated over time. And then, you know, I, I start performing, making music solo with it, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, doing this kind of improvisational thing where, you know, there was no algorithmic stuff involved at this point. Mm-hmm. So it was just, you know, me sitting down with my music system and, and making something, which is, again, it, it's lots of fun. And the, the, the system, I'm a strong believer in iteration and practice. So, and, and this my playing music with my friend Jeremy is really valuable in that way that we would uh, we'd sit down, we'd make music, record the results. You know, I go home the next day and listen to it in my headphones and take notes. Mm-hmm. Basically like, okay, I want to, you know, this didn't sound good. I need to adjust this or I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do that. And then I'd make adjustments to my system and then we'd go play again and then repeat over and over and over and over again. And that allowed me to evolve my music system. So it became more and more flexible and and sounding better and and so forth. So now I have this music performance system, which is really fun. But, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, I feel like I'm always falling into the same kind of rut with it. Like I, I have certain musical habits, like, okay, I always end up putting like a bass drum on the one mm, right, and snares sure. on, you know, on the three or whatever. And so I realized, ah, okay, I have these controls. I can, you know, with, with this lemur thing, I can randomize the controls. I can, make, I can make a button. If I push it, it will just throw all my controls into a random position, right? So I did that. That was the first step towards the generative <laughs> And it's really fun, you know. You you end up like finding these musical spaces that you would never find on your own, right? right? Because right. we we're human beings. We have certain habits. We, you know, we tend to do the same kinds of things. And but this just kind of just throws it, you know, into some random place. And you, it's it's really fun. It's almost kind of like a slot machine or something. You just push. The, you know, I could sit there and push the button over and over again <laughs> and see what comes out. Um, so that was great fun, but as I mentioned before, like pure random does usually doesn't sound too good. Uh, it's too chaotic. It doesn't. There's not enough order or structure to it. Sure. So uh, you know, from there, I started to tune the randomness. So I'd make certain things more likely, certain things less likely. 
certain things I don't want to actually randomize at all. And you know, then I started to get better results. You know, I get more interesting, more musical results. And you know, that 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 was working really well. But then I realized, okay, I can actually make different algorithms. Like you could imagine multiple randomized buttons where each one works in a slightly different way, or each one has the randomness tuned in a in a slightly different way. So that now I have uh, for example, just to take a simple example, like a techno button. Okay, so if I press the techno button, it's going to randomize a lot of the, the controls, but there's certain things it's not going to randomize. It's going to, you know, it, it's the tempo is always going to be like 135 or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always going to be kick drums, uh, you know, so you know, in certain places. So you have like a 4 4 rhythm, you know, things like that that give it some structure, but within that, there's uh, still a lot of variation and randomness. Uh, and then I might have like a, I don't know, like a drum and bass button that structures the beat a little bit differently and so forth. And so uh, you can see how that could lead to this Fields OS thing where and I could basically develop different randomization algorithms where the randomness is tuned in different ways to create these different genres or to, to, to work in different ways. And, you know, the, I basically use that technology uh, for the radio show. So I, you know, I also created this kind of scripting language, you know, where I could execute these randomization algorithms, you know, on the beat, uh, right, as I mentioned right. before, or like create variations. Or, I mean, it's really fun and really powerful because I basically have the musical or the state of the system is, is just a set of numbers. Uh, it's just data, but you know, all values between zero and one. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, you can do all, all, not only can you save that, save the state of the system and recall it later, but you can also do fun things. Like you mentioned breeding music, where I, I would generate two different, compositions or songs, whatever you want to call them, to different states of the system, uh, I would play the first one as like the first parent, so to speak. And then I would play the second parent. Uh, and then I would breed those two together mm. to make a child. <laughs> sure. And then you, then you would hear the child. And if you listen, if you pay close attention, you can really hear like the similarities. You can hear a little bit of both parents in the child. So, you know, it, it's, it's really fun. You know, once you have everything uh, stored in this way as data, you can do all kinds of, of fun things with it. And, and yeah, I mean, as you can tell, uh, you know, I'm also, I did end up going into computer science and, and uh, programming and I, I work in IT for my job. So this, you know, this kind of coding stuff is, second nature at this point so if i have an idea usually i'm able to to realize it because of that but sure in order to oh, i got like 900 questions and i have to like <laughs> even pull my shit together here to be able to ask them sensibly so before we get into the, the algorithms and stuff you talk about your music system what if, what is it i mean is it something is it a coding thing like title is it a uh, a patching system. What what is the music system that you base this off of? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of this Rube Goldberg machine. Like people have asked me to, if I am going to open source it or share it in some way, but it's really hard because it's this patched together collection of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, the I have a controller as I mentioned, is Lemur, uh, mm -hmm. running on an iPad. That's uh, connected to, I'm actually using JavaScript in, uh, which is running in Google Chrome okay. as this sort of like data processing layer, so to speak. So it, it that's what's generating the randomness now. Okay. Uh, originally, I did the randomness inside Lemur itself, but it's kind of limiting. So I right. moved it out. So I kind of have the control layers, Lemur, this kind of data processing and generation control data uh, layer, which is uh, JavaScript running inside of Chrome. Uh, and then that, in turn, 
uh, is sending control data to uh, Reaper, which is my main like audio oh, sound generation engine. Right. Okay. So Reaper's I love Reaper. It's it's really stable and uh, you know customizable, and it has mm-hmm. its own programming language built into it. So I have some like uh, custom plugins, mostly MIDI processing plugins that I've written inside Reaper that are also involved. So it's just kind of evolved that way because as I explained in the beginning, you know, in my history, it uh, it started out as just Reaper. And then I added right. Lemur as the controller. And then I said, oh, well, it, you know, it would be nice if I had this kind of layer in between where I could manipulate and control the the, the control data. Yeah. So that's how like Chrome got involved. There's also I also do visual stuff, uh, responsive visuals, but um, that's another reason why I use Chrome in the middle. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So it's yeah, it's a collection of technologies that are talking to each other. But I do everything in the box. It's all software. Yeah. I don't even own a keyboard or a synth at all. <laughs> so it's, at all. it's it's really interesting though that that you're using that kind of a lot of your work is done in JavaScript on Chrome. I mean, first of all, when you say that you have kind of reactive visuals, what are are the visuals just like WebGL or something in another Chrome window, or or how are you doing visuals off of this? Yeah, um, and you can if you check out my Instagram or Twitter, you can check uh, see what they look like. But okay. Um, and I have a couple different approaches that I'm working with, but yeah, I mean, I'm using 3JS, which is a JavaScript oh, yeah. library for 3D graphics, and that's running inside Chrome. And so there's, I'm using Web MIDI to get, you know, read mm-hmm. the the MIDI data coming into Chrome, right. and then I'm generating, you know, visual events, objects, you know, motion, things like that, based on. The, the MIDI data that's coming in uh, from Reaper, actually. So it, it, it's uh, it's very responsive. It, it's an area that I, the music is primary for me, but um, I'm also very interested in audiovisual music and creating visuals that uh, are very tightly correlated to the sound mm. so that for example you'll you can see like every single hi-hat separately every single drum hit separately you can when the pitch goes up and down you can see that visually so that it's not like an fft audio analysis where it kind of you know can figure out what when there's a bass drum or something like that but it's very very precise, instrument very specific precise. yeah right yeah Yes, yeah, so that's another aspect of of what I do. That's really that's really amazing, and I can see where, in comparison to some of the kind of like bespoke musical tools, um, if you're comfortable working with JavaScript, there's there's a lot of things there, especially in terms of like multiple state saving and stuff like that, that would be really co- uh, really conducive to using JavaScript as as the tooling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I love it. I mean, it's it's a kind of a weird language, and it's always changing um, <laughs> yeah, these true. days. But but I really like it. And you know, as you said, there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, there's I also use P five JS, which is a, there's this language called processing right. for doing visual stuff. And um, the P five JS is the JavaScript version of that. So I, I have I do also use that sometimes. So there's a lot out there that you can a lot of libraries and stuff that you can just download and plug in um, and start using. And yeah, you know, just for I, I did have a period in my life where and actually the first version of my kind of live system was written in PD. Okay. Um, so I did have a, a period where I I worked on these kind of control or flow yeah data flow languages yeah, yeah data flow languages but I, I just found that uh, more text-based programming is, is more natural for me I'm a- able to do what I want easier that way so this is kind of a personal preference you know well, I, that certainly connects though with your history too. I mean, coming from, uh, coming from like typing in code listings in the back of the magazine, it seems <laughs> like it seems like code, creative or not, is going to look like text anyway. 
yeah, at least for me, that's, that's what works the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you talk about sort of like this iteration process and, and it's really fascinating to imagine the history of these things being developed, you know, starting off with pure random and like just being giddy to hear the effect of that, but then eventually having a desire to pull it into a more musical direction. But it makes me wonder to what extent did you have to kind of take a break and say, you know, I really need to kind of study what is it that makes hip hop hip hop or what what makes a footwork track work at a really elemental level. How what was the process of like breaking down the music or did you just like randomly do stuff and be like, oh, that's kind of footworkish. I'm going to put a button that relates <laughs> to that, you know? Well, it was an adventure every week, basically, because <laughs> this was a weekly, this is a weekly radio show, you know. So I, I had time pressure, right? Right. I, and I'm just doing this on the weekends. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm just. <sighs> so this stuff wasn't this stuff wasn't pre cooked ahead of time. I mean, you didn't like already have the UK garage button set up, oh, and no. oh, geez. No, I'd have to sit down and, and code it out and figure it out. I mean. I've also been listening to electronic music since, you know, the mid nineties or something like that. So I have a lot of experience data sure. in my head and I, and I analyze it and think about it a lot. So I don't know if I'm, if I always really hit the mark, you know, I think it's, it's always kind of my interpretation of a certain genre and I'm not sure like a purist in any one of those genres would listen to it and be like, no way this is like, lose it. yeah this, right i guess <laughs> this is not real uk garage or you know whatever but you know i would try to just listen to the genre and, and analyze and think about okay what's going on here and you know like uk garage there's like a ton of swing it's at a certain tempo uh there's a certain beat structure to it things like that. So yeah, I mean, each, each week I just have to sit down and figure it out. And, you know, sometimes it was a, a challenge to come up with, with something, you know, and that's when I started to get, do these more unusual things like the breeding music or Brownie and techno, which right. is a funny one. Like Brownie is a, a reference to this kind of Brownie random noise. Book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So basically that one, it's, it starts out with a kind of a techno type thing for maybe you know, four, eight bars. And then it, it basically starts to slowly fall apart because all of the parameters start to drift in mm. random directions. Oh, so you hear it like the techno track will just slowly break down and <laughs> fall apart until it's like, you know, just struggling and it ends up sounding like free jazz or something. And then the whole cycle starts over again. So that that's actually one of my favorites. It's kind of, It's fun to listen to. Yeah, but it's just a, it was a really interesting project and creative challenge, you know, to come up with something each week. Sure, I'll bet that, that, like you said, that had to push you, uh, push you pretty hard in probably a pretty cool way. So I'm curious, as you started working with this, I mean, there must have been surprises for you along the way and, and like finding that certain kinds of parameter changes or certain kinds of, variations surprised you as being artistically valuable or maybe artistically useless or or even anti-valuable right what are what are some things you found that either were like pleasant surprises or kind of real disappointments yeah i mean well i guess one example i could point out is that you know, for each kind of instrument so to speak or each sonic element i have two different envelopes on it. So for example, I, for, for the bass drum, the snare drum, the bass synthesizer, whatever, each one of those has its own filter envelope okay. and, uh, and pitch envelope. So this allows for a lot of variation. Um, mm. you know, so there's like kind of the starting, the envelope's very simple. It's just like the, the starting point, the ending, Point and how fast does it go to get sure. from point A to point B? So that allows you to have just like a, a simple element, but it can have a lot of variation by just by using those two two envelopes. Um, but yeah, like one thing that I really have to restrict often is is just the pitch bending. 
of the you know the uh, the drums are fine like they i can it's it's fine if those get pitched in strange ways but if i want it to be actually musical or interest you know musically uh, coherent then i have to make sure that the pitched elements are not getting repitched or pitch bent too much because then it, it all will sound like crazy and microtonal and right, and, right. And weird it but, starts you know, sounding like algorithmic music <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah well and, and there's uh i think in the unconstrained episode and maybe the ambient uh, maybe the ambient episode i i do let that run free a bit and you get some kind of weird microtonal sounding stuff so mm. sometimes it can be interesting but that's one thing that you know we humans like you know like clamp down be, yeah yeah, we like things to be pitched uh, in har harmonious in certain ways most of the time. Sure. Now, in going through the, the Fields OS stuff, one of the things I notice is that generally you kind of would pick a tempo and kind of stick with it. Is that because tempo variations were kind of hard to manage within these kind of variation models? No, no, it's 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 not really a problem. I think it's more just I saw a lot of times tempo is a big part of the genre. Mm. Oh, good uh, point. Right, right. Oh, you know, so techno, of course, is is at a certain usually at a certain tempo, and uh, drum and bass like and hip hop too for right, hip hop. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that to me that was just kind of a, a core part of. Uh, of the genre i mean again in like the unconstrained experimental type episodes they those the tempo did jump around a bit right. more so yeah and then uh in terms you talk about having like these sounds having different envelopes and stuff like that i the the sounds themselves are those held in like tracks in reaper or where where does the sound exist where you can sort of like edit it? And then do you have different sound sets that you use for different kind of stylistic purposes? So I'm using all software synthesizers. Ah, okay. Uh, Got it. And sample. So it's mostly synthesized. Ah, got it. Uh, there's no samples or loops involved. Well, there are some samples uh, in the drums for like the, the transients, because I want to get a certain quality to like the snare or... The bass drum or something like that and in those cases but they're just like single shot you know right sample and so. it's encapsulated in a soft synth in some way right got it right exactly and for the most part i kept the the synths and the samples uh kind of the sound generation engine part of it the same through Mo through fields the, all the fields os episodes i think i made some like some changes in like the hip-hop episode i used like a different snare because mm -hmm. i wanted a certain quality right. or i might ch make a few changes here and there but for the most part it's the same like sound engine and yeah it's all all synthesized i actually use this uh, my main synth is it's called surge okay and it's a old it's an older soft synth i actually bought it when it was uh, for, you know, it was a commercial product, but then it went defunct for years. And I, I just, I just loved it. And it's, I was so used to it. Um, I just continued to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then last year or a few months ago, I discovered that uh, it was open sourced and it's, it's alive again and they're developing oh, cool. it. Uh, so I recommend checking that out. It was developed by one of the guys that went on to found uh, uh, Bitwig. Interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, I think Vem Vember Audio was the name of his company, but yeah, he went on to do Bitwig, and so this synth got abandoned. But now it's it's happily alive again and, and thriving. So I, I recommend checking it out. It's a great synth. Is that Surge like S U R G E or S E R G? Right, S U R G. S U R G E. Okay, cool. Well, that sounds really interesting. I'd never even heard of it, so that gives me something to kind of sniff around with. I love it. Now, um, I noticed that uh, recently I got a thing. You're going to be coming to my neck of the woods. I live near Minneapolis, and I see that you're going to oh, be really? playing um, at a festival at the beginning of December called In Situ. Right. Um, yeah. When you go on, like, quote, on the road to do these kinds of performances, 
do you bring anything other than your laptop and lemur on the ipad is is that what or do you keep that tight of a system or do you bring peripherals just to make it feel more at home <laughs> well no, i mean I'm, I'm pretty much a minimalist yeah so it's 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 just my laptop and uh my ipad for for lemur and my uh audio interface uh-huh. and, yeah, that's pretty much it unless unless i need to i'm doing visuals and i need to bring a projector I all right that as well but i really like keeping it simple from that perspective and minimal and you know it's I, i'm not obviously not into modular or, or analog or anything mm-hmm. i'm not a purist in that sense i mean maybe it's just my ears aren't good enough i don't hear hear the difference but uh it's just so convenient and so flexible to do everything in software so i just like to work that way sure now it's interesting because you talk about being not being a purist from the standpoint of like analogs or modulars but what i do notice is that you find yourself in a lot of festivals with people who are sort of like the uh, live coder folks for yeah. whom their performance, a real specific part of like the purest part of it is to be projecting their code on screen while they're developing it and all that stuff. I mean, it, it's funny that while the coding part of it is a part of your practice, that that's also not a thing that you're a purist about either. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have kind of fallen into this community, which is wonderful a great community and uh but i i do also feel a little bit strange about it because yeah i don't do the i don't do live coding obviously algorithms are a big part of what i do and programming is a huge part of what i do but uh my approach is different it's more i think of it as more of a kind of gestural approach to mm-hmm. performance you know i'm sure i'm using the controller and you know, to me, live coding, I mean, I don't have much experience with it. And some people are absolute wizards with it. You know, like Kindome, yeah. Renick Bell, these guys right, are right. amazing what, what they're able to do. But to me, it's it feels like you're trying to build your instrument on stage <laughs> in front of the audience and then and play it at the same time. Yeah. And to me, I would rather have my instruments, practice it a lot, get really good at it, and then, you know, bring my instrument on stage and, and play it. It's just a little bit, you know, different mindset. Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Well, William, I can't believe it, but our time's up already. It's, boy, we blew uh, through that really quickly. Yeah. But before I let you go, why don't you give people a few hints about where to go to experience some of this music to check out some of the field os stuff maybe get a chance to hear or see some of your live performance work or some of the live visuals uh you mentioned instagram and twitter have some stuff what's your handle over there uh it's william fieldsy so william fields with a y at the end okay all right on both uh that's on both instagram and twitter i don't do facebook for my artist stuff okay um so yeah i mean i have uh williamfields.com uh and there's links to everything there and uh but i'm most active on twitter uh at william fieldsy and on instagram also at william fieldsy so yeah and i have um let's see fields os you could check out on Bandcamp. Right. Um, yeah, that's williamfields.bandcamp.com he has your release right. work on it too, right? right. Yep, and, and I've got this um, festival as you mentioned in Minneapolis. I'm a little scared of the weather. Um, oh, <laughs> it's, no, <laughs> it's, December. it's December isn't... No, nah, it doesn't get bad till February. It gets worse. Fe- <laughs> February is when you'll cry. But. Oh, no. Uh, but yeah, that's I'll be performing and giving a talk there on augmented creativity so that should be should be fun and i have a a release coming out soon hopefully in the next month or two on conditional records called shaka maxon uh and i've got an amazing set of uh remixes from some uh, incredible artists uh, that are going to be on that as well so keep an eye out out for that too 
but yeah, feel free to to get in touch. You know, if you have any questions, send me an email or on Twitter or, or anything. I'd be happy to to talk. Fantastic. Well, William, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat. It was super revealing. It actually makes me want to start working on my own algorithms because especially <laughs> as you talk about this iterative thing, it's like, well, you're never going to iterate if you don't get started, right? That's right. That's <laughs> a big part of it. Yep. Indeed. That's well, right. thank you so much for the time. It was so fabulous to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Again, it was an honor. All right. Well, with that, I'll let you have your day. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, many thanks to William for the great discussion. My goodness, there's a lot to consider there. And if you are like me and have any interest in fiddling around with uh, algorithmic uh, song creation or sequencing or whatever, uh, you probably came out of that as inspired as I did. I want to thank him so much for that. And if you're interested in more, please jump over either to the podcast uh, show page or if you're interested, jump over to Patreon, where not only can you find out more about my personal interactions with uh, with William, but also to hear a special generative uh, piece that he did specifically for the patrons of the podcast, drop over to patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. Otherwise, as always, artmusictech.libsyn.com will have the show notes. You can get all the links for information there. I want to thank you, the listeners, for continuing to come on by and listen, sharing, all that kind of stuff. It's really great. And remember, if you're in Minneapolis this week, you're going to get a chance to hear William as well as a number of other people uh, do both talks as well as performances at the In-Situ con concert. So, Please, again, you can check the show notes in for, for information on that. I hope to see you there. I'll be there every night. So uh, hopefully we'll uh, get a chance to bump shoulders. With that, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much and have a good one.